Okay, so three years ago, I am Helen B. Louise, and I'm the museum director of um, the Oregon Historical Society, and I've been with them for four years. So kind of put that in context that three years ago, we started talking about redoing our Oregon history, the overarching Oregon history exhibit. There was a lot of reasons to do it. One, it was 14 years old, and after thousands of people going through there, it was looking rather tired and worn out. And also the content was really outdated in its presentation. Oh, I forgot. I have something here. OK. Um, the driving force was to really refresh it, but to include voices that make up Oregon history that had not been represented there before. Voices that are commonly left out when you talk about Oregon history in favor of the settler and the pioneer story. Frankly, the pioneer story is the safe route to take. OHS decided, OHS decided that we were willing to take some risks and possibly make people uncomfortable. Side note, we did. We chose to include stories from all the people that lived here, from the first indigenous peoples to the settlers and immigrants, and then the later arrivals. Okay, there we go. To accomplish this, we built a very large, inclusive partner group. And when we went into it, we were really prepared to tell the full story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The partner group reflected all the people that we could gather that were present in the history of Oregon. So it was a large group. And we really, the, the museum theory we based this on is shared authority. And we shared the authority for the story with the community and with the partners that we worked with. So it does get a little messy doing it that way. But we traveled. We visited the nine federally recognized tribes several times. The process we used was very expansive, and it's very similar to what um, you all are doing, where you're having big ideas, you narrow, narrow to smaller ideas, you review, you send it out for more review, you refine what you've done, and you come up with an end product. One of the biggest discussions we had in the beginning, and where this floor plan is helpful, is do you tell the story from a thematic or a chronological point of view? And I'm talking interpretation, not the physical space as much. Both sides of the argument could be made. Thematic is really how your college professors and your teachers want to um, tell a story. They want to teach history from a thematic standpoint. And I really advise that you include educators when you start working on interpretation. But we also know that there's a lot of people that are more comfortable with chronology. They need to be grounded in space and time. So we decided we'll do both. And what you can see in the center of this slide is a spine, and that's the timeline. And that is a very deeply layered timeline. And then around the edges, it's the story is told thematically. Specifically, let me see if I can reach one. They're called across time stations. And what we do is we ground them in the time period where they're located, and then we um, tell current stories and stories in between on the time frame. And the point was our driving, our number one goal, our driving force was to help people understand that history is relevant and it's important today. We know that in our fast-paced information world, we, 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 we don't make those connections as easily as perhaps once was done. And we at the Oregon Historical Society felt a great deal of urgency to demonstrate the significance of history. With this in mind, we began to think and talk about what our visitors might want. To this end, we built evaluations into two phases of the process. The first one was to broadly test what folks might want to see in an Oregon history exhibit. And the second one was later on when we were developing text and graphics. And we wanted to test that to see 
if we were making the points we thought we were making. There's a lot of um, value in having really intelligent people in the room, but at some point you have to ask your audience, do they get what you're trying to tell them? Plan on responding to these, what these evaluations reveal. We'll talk more about evaluations in a little bit. But this is a really critical part of it, is you need to ask your audience what they want to see and if they understand what they are seeing. One thing that's very key when you're working on interpretation to remember is that to engage different types of visitors, it works best if you have one big idea that ties the entire interpretation together. That's very painful when you talk about a place like this that has so many stories to tell. You need one unifying thought that will follow the entire process and tie it all together. Your interpretation is for the visitor. It's not for historians. It's not for peers. It's not for us. To meet people where they are in their life, you will need to think about using different learning modalities. And that's really what you're seeing. They're pretty pictures. I'm proud of the project. But what you're really seeing here are the different learning modalities we used. You have multimedia, you have artifacts, you have tactile elements, and then programming. For your purposes, since the interpretation is primarily outside, how you present the information is going to be key. And I think that the designers you have here are going to be very critical in choosing what you do, and they'll be very helpful. But I would very urge you to keep it modular and keep whatever you do replaceable, and I'll explain why. To really better understand um, your visitors, I would highly recommend looking at the work of John Falk. Remember, you have to earn your visitors' attention. You're competing for a lot of leisure time activities. Important to keep in mind that your interpretation on this project can only do so much. You can inspire curiosity. You can introduce new points of view. You can give content. You can give people a meaningful experience. What you can't do is please everyone talk about everything, nor can you include every fact. Again, very painful part of the process. Your interpretation is going to be just one part of the entire experience. You will use programs, lectures, books, social media, and much more to build on what the visitor gets out of the experience of visiting the site. Yet, you're not done. This is a living experience. Audiences change. You will need to incorporate the ability to change with them to remain relevant. Otherwise, they'll see it once. They'll go home and say, yeah, saw that. They won't come back unless they have a visitor in town. You want more than that for this project. You need a team that will maintain the interpretation, that will evaluate how your visitors are experiencing the work and make the adjustments as needed. This is not just 2037. You commit to the project, it's beyond that. So you can see by now that this process is circular. One piece informs the next and the next and so on. You've got a lot of good project managers. You're gonna have timelines, schedules, budgets, deliverables, deadlines, build in a healthy contingency, so 150 million plus, because I guarantee you're going to need it. And I see some people smiling. It's true, you need a good contingency. Play to your strengths. We have the stuff. We've got cool stuff. But you have place, and place can be a very, very powerful tool. If you activate the place with people and their stories, and I'm hearing that a lot. I'm really hearing a lot of conversation here that really, I really just needed to say what you all said before. But you activate the place with people and stories, because I guarantee you people want to come and they find themselves in the story. You will capture the imagination of your visitors, and you will earn their attention.